one of the questions <coughs> is what happens when a transacting factor is mutated. So normally, um, the, the, the mutations that I showed you in the first part of the talk, they affect only one gene. But you can well imagine that if you have a splicing factor that is mutated in some way, uh, then the number of splicing events that are affected are uh, much greater than just a single gene. And indeed, uh, this has actually, proof of this has come from animal models. So in most animal models that have been obtained were particular splicing factors like SF2, ESF, that uh, Silvano was talking earlier on, where in these animal models, when these splicing factors are knocked down, they are almost always embryonic lethal or they have a, a very severe phenotype. Um, in our case, what I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit about uh, splicing changes in splicing factor and, or in a particular splicing factor and to neurodegenerative diseases that are um, ALS, so uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and frontotemporal dementia. Now, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, I think, doesn't need an introduction. You all know what it is. In the States, it's also known as Lou Gehrig disease from a very famous baseball player that was one of the first uh, people characterized with, uh, with uh, this kind of disease. It said uh, it basically has to do with the uh, degeneration of the upper motor neurons, uh, but uh, cognitive, um, uh, cognitive abilities are, are not affected or not a lot affected. And frontotemporal dementia uh, is the second most common cause of early onset uh, um, progressive cognitive impairment, uh, basically it's dementia, uh, following Alzheimer's disease. And these two uh, kind of diseases very recently in 2006 have been kind of uh, joined together by the identification of the protein that is responsible for causing them. And this protein is called TAR uh, uh, TDP, that stands for TAR DNA binding protein. I'll just tell you in a second uh, what, what, why it has this funny name. Uh, it is uh, an apparently very um, classical HNRMP protein because it has, uh, it is not very long, only 400 uh, residues long. It has two RNA recognition uh, motifs inside that are useful to bind RNA. And um, in, in a, apparently it is uh, just a classical HNRMP protein. So this protein was first identified in 1996 when people were looking at uh, uh, factors that could uh, uh, eventually bind the TAR uh, DNA element of the HMV1 virus. Uh, they identified TDP43 and that's why they call it TAR DNA binding protein. Then uh, nobody actually thought about uh, um, uh, studying this protein any longer because it was not a very efficient repressor of HIV-1 transcription. And funnily enough, I think there is this nice parallelism between uh, discovery of this protein and work in the neurodegeneration field because in the same years that this protein was discovered, uh, people actually started to recognize frontotemporal lobar degeneration as a disease, as a disease that was quite different from Pick's disease and uh, uh, which in turn, you know, was quite different from um, the huge number, the Alzheimer, the Alzheimer field. Um, how did we come across this protein? At the time, um, in, in our lab, at the time we were working on a particular splicing event, that is CFTR exon 9 alternative splicing in humans, and the reason we were looking at it is because um, in, CFTR, in humans, CFT, CFTR exon 9 is alternatively spliced. But when uh, exon 9 is excluded from the final mRNA, then people develop uh, certain monosymptomatic forms of cystic fibrosis. And the reason why CFTR exon 9 is excluded in some individuals and not in others is because inclusion of this exon is really due to a, uh, the presence of two polymorphic repeats near the 3' splice site, one represented by a uh, TG motif, a polymorphic TG motif, and another one by a certain number of Ts. And what happens is that individuals that have a low number of Ts and a high number of TGs, they tend to develop the disease, and those that, uh, like most of us, who will have a high number of Ts and a small number of TGs, then they will actually be normal because they will be able to make enough full-length CFTR protein 
and this will not end up in the disease. And at the time I, I was a postdoc in Tito Barale's lab and my task was to find the proteins that were binding to this motif. And so uh, we did, I did quite a lot of affinity, RNA affinity purification and in 2001 I uh, saw that I actually managed to identify TDP43. So um, in 2001 the funny thing that happened is that mm, people who were working in frontotemporal lobar degeneration they realized that frontotemporal degeneration really was came in two flavors one which was due to mutation in the tau gene so the one that I just told you uh, before with the uh, alternative splicing of the exon 10 and the majority of patients affected by FTLD they had ubiquitinated inclusions of a protein that they didn't know what it was. Uh, in in 2000, 2001 uh, completely unknown to us these people uh, since 2001 to 2006 they looked for the protein that was making the inclusions in the brain of the patients and using a particular uh, approach they identified TDP43 as the uh, protein that was actually responsible for making these inclusions. And since then, as you can see here, uh, TDP43 that was a completely unknown protein, basically only us who are studying it, has become a star protein and the number of bibliographic entries in PubMed actually are doubling every year which you know uh, keeping up with the bibliography has become a job by itself. So what happens in the disease? Basically this TDP43 that is normally nuclear and as you see we found it, we characterized it as a splicing factor. Uh, in the disease, in the neurons of the patients it is uh, from the nucleus it is exported or is uh, sequestered in the cytoplasm and there it's aggregated, it is phosphorylated, it's cleaved and it's ubiquitinated. And what we think now is that this change can actually uh, be directly connected with the disease and this can be uh, actually can occur in two ways. Uh, one way is a gain of function mechanism so when you have a protein that is normally nuclear and is transported to the cytoplasm then this new localization can be toxic to the cell because the cell doesn't like uh, the protein to be in the cytoplasm. This protein was built to stay in the nucleus but also the other possibility is that this aggregate formation is really pretty much harmless and uh, that uh, if you have loss of this protein from the nucleus all the processes that, this process, that are controlled by this protein, uh, including especially splicing in our case, they become disrupted and therefore have eventually the uh, death of the motor neuron. This is quite important as far as is concerned because of course you can well imagine that if uh, a loss of function scenario is true or a gain of function scenario is true then this changes quite a lot uh, the way that we can uh, look at therapy. Um, but I, I won't go into that because this is oh, totally at the hypothetical stage. Um, but uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, of, as soon as this protein came out, of course, people were a little bit skeptical because they said, well, uh, the protein no doubt is making up the aggregation, but maybe it's just an epiphenomenon, so it's just something that happens, but it's not directly connected with the disease. And this one was actually solved uh, just one year later because us together, well, um, Chris Shaw in, in London, and we also collaborated in this study, we showed that there were mutations in this protein that could be inherited with the disease and so were directly associated with uh, disease onset. And now we know uh, a lot of mutations that are, uh, they are mostly missense mutations that are localized in this C-terminus of TDP43 and which are associated with disease, uh, but uh, even so, there is also a lot of, I don't want you to read this, of course, you can, if you want you can look it in, uh, in the CD that you'll be uh, given. There is a lot of evidence that some of these mutations are pathologic and act through a gain of function mechanism. But even so, mutations are present in a very small minority of patients. And uh, at the moment only 4 to 6 percent, or, or let's say of all ALS patients, you find mutations in this gene only in point, uh, 0.5 to 2% of all the patients. Um, if you are interested in what they do, of course, we now, uh, I recently made a database that has been published recently and that describes all these mutations in details. Uh, and also, um, we started uh, looking at mutations in frontotemporal 
those mutations were all identified in people who were affected by LS. So we were wondering, together with people in Brescia, whether mutations could also be found in people that had motor neuron disease. And uh, we did find one mutation uh, that is a missense mutation, but we also found several variations that did not occur, were not missense mutation, but they occurred into uh, introns. And therefore, one of the questions that we asked in the lab was, uh, what, uh, what is the consequences of these mutations? First of all, because the missing mutations was the N267S missing mutation was the one that was identified as the first. Uh, what we f did it was a Western blot analysis from the lymphoblast of the patients, and we saw that uh, these patients were producing much less TDP43 with respect to controls. And um, when we looked at the mRNA uh, of all those patients, what we saw is that uh, indeed, the, uh, the cells of the patient carrying the missense mutation was uh, actually expressing very low amounts of uh, TDP43 messenger RNA in their cells. But what I thought was also very interesting is that all the other patients that, has these, that had these intronic variations or 5' UTR variations in the sequence, they were expressing levels of TDP43 that was quite different from the controls. And this actually um, made, us, made us ask a, a very important question. Uh, An important question is, obviously, what is keeping the levels of TDP43 expression uh, in, normal, in normal conditions. And we knew that there was something uh, going on because at the time we were also making some stable cell lines that were expressing a, um, um, an inducible SI resistant form of TDP43 and mutant TDP43s. And what we observed in this case was that when the wild type uh, mutant and SI resistant TDP43 was expressed, the endogenous TDP43 all was downregulated, so in, in a very specific way. And this downregulation did not occur when we overexpressed the mutant that was incapable of binding to mRNA. Um, this downregulation and uh, specific downregulation of TDP43, of endogenous TDP43 levels, uh, was not only seen at the protein level, but was also seen at the mRNA level. So, for example, you see here that when you overexpress your wild type exogenous TDP43, the, you have the complete disappearance of the uh, 4.2 and 2.8 uh, mRNAs that specify for the TDP43 protein normally. But when you have the mutant that does not bind to RNA, uh, then uh, this downregulation at the mRNA level does not occur. So uh, the connection, of course, is not at the protein level, but must be at the mRNA level. And a possible connection between these two, uh, this downregulation was found using clip analysis. So clip analysis is a system where you can actually see where your protein is binding to a particular uh, mRNA in vivo, and using this clip analysis in collaboration with James Tollervy, what we found is that TDP43 was capable of binding to a sequence in its own 3' UTR. Um, we validated this, of course, by band shift, so um, we found that really it was not just a single sequence to which TDP43 TDP43 was binding, but it was a quite a huge stretch of the uh, TDP43 3' prime UTR. We are talking about almost 600 nucleotide, and um, uh, we also used the heterologous assay to prove that just these 600 nucleotides were sufficient to actually cause the downregulation. Because what we did was we made a hybrid construct where we just kept uh, exon 5 of TDP43, intron 5, exon 6, and then all the entire 3' UTR sequence. So when you transfect this construct into the cell that overexpress wild type TDP43, then this construct uh, is downregulated following overexpression. If you just do the mutation, if you just delete the original clip sequence that was found uh, by ULE, uh, then you still have downregulation, but to a lower extent. But if you just get rid of the entire 600 nucleotides, then downregulation does not occur anymore. Um, how this, down, this downregulation occurs is not uh, 
uh, um, is still uh, the matter of uh, study. Uh, we ruled out uh, uh, the um, present, the significant um, effect uh, that could uh, be uh, given by NMD because we treated the cell with cyclohexamine and we didn't see the appearance of any uh, NMD resistant species in, in our assay. Uh, at the moment, the most, uh, the two likely ways that down regulation can be achieved are either mRNA destabilization or also an involvement of the exosome dependent down regulation. But uh, the situation that you can see here is that TDP43 levels inside the cells are kept constant through, uh, uh, bind, uh, through this pathway. So uh, TDP43 is capable of binding its own 3' prime UTR. Um, if you have a lot of TDP43, then uh, the mRNA is destabilized, the exosome is activated, and so you have a selective degradation of the two mRNAs that pr uh, are responsible for the production of this protein. On the other hand, if you have low TDP43 concentrations, then occupancy of this region here will be lower, and therefore you have an increased production of TDP43. So this is a negative feedback loop. Uh, but um, so uh, how many genes are, is TDP43 capable of affecting, and especially how many alternative splicing events? And in just the last few minutes of this talk, uh, I will tell you what we know about it. Uh, and what we did was actually to get these cells where we overexpress our uh, TDP43 and where we um, uh, see uh, and where we knock down also TDP43. And we did a microarray analysis using um, the chips, the, the Affymetrix genome splice arrays. And what these gene splice arrays do is that they, they provide a gene level analysis, but most especially they look at, they make an exon level analysis and they actually tell you how many cassette exons are affected, how many mutually exclusive splicing events are affected, or how many five prime or three prime alternative splice sites um, are affected. And if you look at the uh, output of this uh, analysis, and this is something that I, that we are just analyzing now in the lab, you see that the, at the level of the, at the gene level, if you knock down TDP43 or you overexpress it, um, or, and even if you put back a mutant that cannot bind RNA, you have a huge number of genes that change in expression level. So we are talking about almost 2,000 genes. Um, not all of these genes, of course, of course, will be direct hits of TDP43. They, are, they may well be uh, secondary uh, effects there playing a, a huge role. Uh, but as far as uh, uh, the, the, the alternative splicing is concerned, you can see that getting rid of a splicing factor like TDP43, there are a huge number of events that are affected. So uh, if you just get rid of TDP43, you have 428 cassette exons that are um, that are uh, that change in expression, several mutually exclusive exons, several events of alternative five prime and three prime splice side usage, uh, and this also occurs if you uh, overexpress TDP43. So this is the reason why TDP43 levels must be maintained at a very constant uh, uh, rate, at a very constant. Uh, expression uh, level, um, and, uh, and, uh, if you, and we are now currently validating uh, several of these, uh, of these events looking for uh, potential uh, alternative splicing events that could be eventually connected with neurodegeneration and loss in uh, motor neurons following a loss of function effect. Uh, I'll just tell you one of the new ones that have been that has been validated in our system uh, and also has been confirmed is the selective skipping of this uh, new target for uh, TDP43 alternative splicing action that's called PolDIP3. This is a protein that uh, interacts with, uh, with a DNA polymerase delta subunit and um, yeah, can also can regulate uh, cell growth. And you can see here that if you um, normally, this protein has quite a lot of exons, uh, in, a, in particular, exon 3 is normally included. But if you 
deplete uh, uh, the cells from TDP43, then uh, uh, this exon 3 is skipped. These are duplicate experiments. Um, if you put back an SI resistant TDP43, then um, the exon inclusion is again restored. And if you uh, put back a, a mutant of TDP43 that cannot bind RNA, then you again skipping occurs. So this is a new an interesting target of TDP43, and of course, uh, you see it here, and of course, we are currently validating what we think are the most interesting and most uh, uh, important ones from, you know, the screening analysis. And this is just to give you an idea that if you, are, if you touch any splicing factor in the cell, uh, you, you affect a lot of splicing events. So, just to close up. And um, this is the end. Thank you. Yeah, so.